On the lazy morning of March 11, 1958, Walter Gregg and his family worked and played near the home that he had built on land that his family had owned for nearly a hundred years. When an Air Force plane flew over, he didn't think much of it. Air Force planes flew over his property quite frequently. Little could the Greggs know that they were about to become part of Cold War history. In 2003, Walter Gregg, then 82, said, Not too many people can say they've had a nuclear bomb dropped on them. Not too many would want to. The 1958 Mars Bluff nuclear weapon incident deserves to be remembered. At 8 a.m. on March 11, 1958, a specialized crew began loading a B-47E aircraft, number 531-876-Alpha, of the 375th Bombardment Squadron of the 305th Bombardment Wing. Writing in 2013 edition of Air Force Magazine, aviation historian and former B-47 pilot Walter J. Boyne described the B-47 as the perfect strategic weapon for its time. The Boeing B-47 Stratojet, an official nickname never used by its crews, had entered service in 1951. The radical new design used swept wings, an innovation largely possible because of data captured from Germans during the Second World War, and jet engines placed on nacelles underneath the wing, innovations that would affect both military and passenger aircraft production in the post-war era. The bomber had exceptional performance characteristics, with a top speed in excess of 600 miles per hour and a range in excess of 2,000 miles. The B-47 became a mainstay of the U.S. Air Force's Strategic Air Command's bomber strength. Eventually, 2,032 were built, and manufacturers Boeing, Lockheed, and Douglas were all contracted to build B-47s to meet the delivery schedule. Along with the B-47, the Air Force built a large fleet of in-air refueling tankers, at first Boeing KB-50s and KC-97s, and starting in 1957, the more capable KC-135. Boeing explained, the tankers gave legs to the B-47 fleet and established it as a global threat. But those legs required hours of flight time, which placed quite a stress on the plane's three-person crew. As Boyne noted, the three-man crew flew a vastly more complicated aircraft than had the ten-man crews of the B-29 or B-50. And thus the plane that was being loaded the morning of March 11th was part of a program to prepare crews for the long-distance missions that would be required in the case of war with the Soviet Union. The plane was participating in Operation Snow Flurry. Clark Rumrell, an Air Force officer who was stationed at Hunter Air Force Base at the time, wrote in a September 2000 edition of American Heritage magazine, Snow Flurry was not routine training, but rather part of a unit-simulated combat mission and special weapons exercise. Aircraft 53-1876-Alpha, accompanied by three other B-47s from the 375th Bombardment Squadron, was to fly to England, conducting a mid-air refueling en route off the east coast of Canada, and make a practice bomb run over England transmitting an electronic signal to simulate the bomb release. Computers on the ground were to determine the accuracy of the drop and award points accordingly. The crew would then fly to a strategic air command base in North Africa and back to Georgia. Had the mission been completed, Rumble explained, the crew would have had a tense, exhausting 18-hour day. Such missions were of particular importance. As Boyne explains, the bomber debuted at a time when Strategic Air Command was undergoing an explosive expansion in size that diluted standardization efforts and the effectiveness of training and safety procedures. In a period of expansion, training crews on the operation of the complex aircraft was more difficult, and crews needed experience. But there was another component of this special weapon exercise. The B-47 was to carry a nuclear bomb to Bruntingthorpe Air Base in England. That chilly morning in March, the crew was loading a Mark VI nuclear bomb. The Mark VI was a fission, that is nuclear, not thermonuclear bomb, developed from the Mark III Fat Man bomb that had been dropped on Nagasaki in August 1945. The bomb weighed 7,600 pounds, was 10 feet 8 inches long, and had a maximum diameter of 61 inches. Its nuclear yield was around 30 kilotons. However, the bomb was not carried assembled. That is, to prevent detonation, the nuclear core was carried separately from the weapon. In the event of war, the bomb would be assembled in flight. That morning, the load proved to be troublesome, as the loading team had trouble engaging the steel locking pin. The B-47 was difficult to fly. Boeing explained that the plane was a hybrid of World War II metallurgy, construction techniques, and aerodynamic theory that was sometimes inadequate for the new era of jet engines. The plane could be especially difficult to handle when fully loaded. 
Nuclear bombs of the era were heavy, and as a safety measure, the bomb was designed with an emergency release, a pneumatically powered catch allowing the crew to jettison the bomb almost immediately in the event they were encountering difficulties in takeoff or landing. During regular flight, a manually inserted locking pin locked the bomb in place so that it could not be dropped accidentally, but the pin was disengaged during takeoff and landing. The crew called for help from the Weapons Release Systems Supervisor, who managed to get the locking pin to engage by jiggling the pin with a hammer until it was seated. However, Rumrell notes the crew failed to run the locking pin through its engage-disengage cycle, possibly because of pressure to complete the loading process in a specified amount of time. The plane was loaded and the crew went through its pre-flight checks and pre-flight briefing. The pilot Captain Earl Keeler started the engines at 3.42 p.m. and following procedure, the co-pilot, Captain Charles Woodruff, disengaged the locking pin, which was operated by a lever, for takeoff. As the plane gained altitude, Woodruff used the lever to re-engage the pin, but it wouldn't re-engage. This was a problem as the pin would have to be manually seated. The job fell to the navigator bombardier, Captain Bruce Kolka, but it was not as simple as it sounds. The B-47 was pressurized, and sending Kolka to the bomb bay required depressurizing the plane, which at 15,000 feet required that the crew go on oxygen. Perhaps worse, as Rumrell explained, the entrance to the bomb bay was so narrow that a parachute could not be worn into it. Kolka would be required to climb around the bomb bay of a jostling aircraft, searching for a mechanism he'd never been trained to find, with no parachute, should something go wrong in the bay. The pin mechanism, it turns out, was high up above the bomb. Kolka, in trying to climb to reach the pin, accidentally grabbed the emergency bomb release mechanism as a handhold. The 7,000 pound bomb released, landing momentarily on the bomb bay doors. Kolka had mere moments to find something to hold on to. As the huge bomb broke open the bomb bay doors, Rumrell said, he managed to grab something, he wasn't sure what, and haul himself to safety. Walter Gregg had been a paratrooper during the war. On March 11th, according to the Charlotte Observer, the 32-year-old was fixing a bench in a makeshift workshop in the garage, about 50 feet to the rear of his frame house, in the Mars Bluff community, some 10 miles east of Florence, South Carolina. His son, 6-year-old Walter Jr., was in the garage with him. His wife, Ethel May Helms Gregg, called Effie, was inside the house sewing. Their daughters, 9-year-old twins Helen and Francis, played in the yard nearby with their cousin, Ella Davies. The newspaper continued, Overhead, the lazy drone of an airplane engine could be heard. It grew louder. Greg observed as he worked. Must be flying pretty low, he mused. Suddenly, a deafening explosion rent the air. While the bomb did not have its nuclear core, it did include the high explosive trigger, a part of the bomb that compresses the nuclear core to a critical mass. The bomb that had just fallen 15,000 feet contained around 2,000 pounds of high explosive. Rumble explained, there are two types of high explosives that could be used in the trigger. One could be set off by concussion, such as a bullet or contact with the ground. The other, the type the military invariably insists upon, could take great physical abuse without going off. Unfortunately, the triggers used in nuclear weapons in 1958 contain the former. According to the Florence Morning News, Walter Jr. said, Daddy, Daddy, what happened? His father replied, I don't know, Sonny, I think an airplane exploded. Greg told the Associated Press, it must have been a moment before the air cleared from the dust and I could see. I looked around and my living house was gone. It was falling all to pieces. The garage started to fall apart too. I got out of there. Effie told the paper, I remember sewing and the next thing I can recall I was crawling out from under boards and plaster. In March 2018, Ella, nine at the time of the explosion, told the Associated Press that she remembered stacking bricks to make a kitchen to play house, and the next thing she knew she was running down the driveway with blood streaming from a gash above her eye. She doesn't remember the actual blast. Her cousin, Helen, remembered getting up from the ground to find an entire stand of pines where the six-year-old had just climbed down from her tree fort, flattened. The Griggs put the kids in a car and raced to a hospital. Ella told the Associated Press that she remembers the speedometer reading 80 miles per hour and her yelling at the driver to slow down. The Griggs' home was only some 300 yards away from U.S. Highway 301, which the Charlotte Observer described as a major New York to Miami route. A traveling salesman on the road named J.A. Sanders said the concussion was so great it turned his car around on the road. Highway patrolman D.D. Mobley had just stopped on the side of the road. He told the morning news, It was like a whoosh, a tremendous blast that shook my car. It shook me for an instant. I didn't know what happened. A nearby resident, W.G. Wallace, reported that he heard the bomb whistle as it fell. The blast leveled the chimney on his house and broke windows. 
Greg explained to the paper that the bomb, or whatever it was, landed about 100 yards from the house, right in the garden. It left a hole about 40 feet in diameter, and I don't know how deep. The morning news reported that portions of the weapon were found 700 yards from the crater. In the air, Keeler's first priority was to report the incident to his superiors, Rumroll explained. In case of an unscheduled bomb drop, Air Force regulations require the crew to immediately notify its base by a special coded message. But there was a problem, he continued. Because the procedure had never been used, the operations center at Hunter Air Force Base didn't recognize this strange incoming message. Keeler eventually had to radio the local Florence airport and ask them to telephone the Air Force Base that the plane had lost a device. The conversation was overheard by a private pilot and reported in newspapers. The crew then flew over to photograph the site with their aerial camera and then had to circle for nearly three hours to burn off fuel before landing. Rummel recalled that upon landing, the crew was treated as if there was a possibility they'd dropped the bomb deliberately. Their sidearms were confiscated and they were locked in a room until they convinced commanders that the loss was an accident. Teams from the Air Force and Civil Air Patrol quickly came and sealed off the area. They reported that they found no radiation. None of the Greg's injuries were life-threatening, although Effie and Ella had to have stitches. In 2003, Walter Gregg told The Sun News, It's incredible when you think about it that nobody got killed. In the end, the bomb damaged about a dozen homes and the Mount Mitzvah Baptist Church. The Greggs also lost an unknown number of chickens in the blast, although their kitten, Mitzi, was uninjured. The crater, while on private land, is still visible today. Incredibly, the Mars Bluff incident was the second time that the Air Force had lost a device in a period of just over a month. Just the previous February, another nuclear bomb had been lost near Tybee Island, Georgia, when it was jettisoned by a B-47 after a mid-air collision. Both stories were widely reported at the time and raised concerns in both the United States and Europe over the U.S. nuclear arsenal and U.S. planes, and received condemnation from the Soviet Union. It did spur the United States to make certain changes in the safety mechanisms for the nuclear arsenal, including formulating different high explosives for the nuclear triggers that were less likely to explode by accident. Eventually, the Air Force reimbursed the Greggs for the damages, but it wasn't enough to rebuild, something that his daughter said Walter Gregg resented all his life. Still, Greg became friends with the crew of the aircraft, who reached out to him to apologize for bombing his home. They corresponded throughout his life. Walter Gregg passed away in 2013 at the age of 92. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long, and if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.